Hey guys, uh, this is going to be part one of the Industrial Revolution lecture. Um, I'm going to do it in two parts to make it easier to upload. And I'm going to try to be as brief as possible throughout this lecture. But um, in chapter seven, we talk about the Industrial Revolution or the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And this changes on the American economy, changes the way Americans live. For example, if you have to wake up by an alarm clock, that came out of the Industrial Revolution. The idea of standardized time. Um, making sure that you are at your job, you know, working 10 hours a day, whatever you do. The, all these things come out of people starting to work in factories and changing American life. So these are the things we're going to be going over when we talk about the Industrial Revolution. So kind of setting the stage for growth. Uh, the Embargo Act from Eli Whitney. Um, cotton, clothes, and interchangeable parts. All big parts of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and each one of these we'll go over in more detail. The expanses of transportation uh, for, with the Industrial Revolution, we'll see the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, which will link the East Coast all the way to the West Coast in California. Uh, harnessing steam power, so not having to rely on manual labor. Um, accelerating and manufacturing process. Uh, taking the good with the bad and the ugly side of the Industrial Revolution, because there are some pretty bad atrocities that are committed during this time as well. Um, so we have the Embargo Act and the War of 1812. We've talked a great deal about the War of 1812, but just to reiterate, uh, it was a conflict where the British Navy, uh, with the British Navy, resulted in much of the public outrage and the passage of the Embargo Act in 1807, which ended up, or which ended the export of American goods and essentially stopped the importation of goods from other nations. So if you wanted anything that required any manufacturing, you had to buy it in America. Uh, eventually this resulted in a war with Great Britain in 1812. Uh, America needed better transportation systems and increased economic independence. As a result, manufacturing began to expand. And so you see here the major campaigns of the War of 1812. I went over many of these. But what's important is as the Americans push more and more into the Great Lakes, we'll see new cities like Detroit and Chicago emerge, which will become industrial hubs because they could ship their goods throughout the Great Lakes. And with the completion of the Erie Canal in the 1830s, it will connect that to the Atlantic Ocean, connect all the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so we have Eli Whitney's Cotton You guys re will read a little bit more about this, but Eli Whitney... Uh, was the inventor of the cotton gin in 1794. Um, and the basis of this machine is it separated cotton seeds from the fiber. Used to be you had to do this by hand. It was very um, labor intensive. It took a lot of people. But the South ramped up its cotton supply, um, ending raw cotton or supplying raw cotton to the north. Uh, to be processed into cloth. So the raw cotton would be processed by the cotton gin in the south, grown in the south, and then they would ship it up to the north where it would be made into actual textiles, whether that be blankets, shirts, what have you. Um, and spinning and weaving processes were combined together in one factory, developed the textile industry, which exploded throughout New England. And we'll talk more about that later on. Um, in 1846, the sewing machine revolutionized the manufacturing of clothing which could be made in factories instead of at home, making it cheaper. When you can mass produce something, that makes the cost go down. But there was an ugly side to the invented, invention of the cotton gin. As cotton became more profitable, more cotton plantations began to string up throughout the South, or spring up throughout the South, in much of those regions that were opened up by Andrew Jackson with Indian removal. So we see cotton plantations start to extend into Alabama, and Mississippi, and with that, the expansion of slavery into those states. Um, we also have the development of interchangeable parts. Originally designed for weapons, interchangeable parts were a pract for practical purposes. Um, pretty much, you made things identical, so you made each rifle identical and used the same parts, so that way, if something broke, you could just buy the part. You didn't have to replace the entire weapon itself. And this lends itself to machines. So we start seeing 
machines, not just one person, one engineer that makes this one machine and there's not any parts. If you do have to make a new part, you have to find somebody to make that custom part, which is really expensive. But now, if we can make all the machines identical, we can swap out parts. When one little thing breaks, you know, we don't have to ship off for a custom part. We can have a parts, you know, storage where we can just go and grab the part, fix the machine quickly. And so this also lowers the cost of manufacturing. We also have transportation. Uh, as Americans move west, um, commerce and industry expanded. Uh, the three main modes of transportation um, increased dramatically, and these included waterways, roads, and railroads. Um, in the beginning of the 1800s, it was mainly waterways. Uh, we, we do have the completion of the National Road, which was part of the Second National Bank of the United States, which connected uh, north and south, the improvement of roads in the south and north. Um, then we have railroads, and this will be what really takes off throughout the 1800s and be the main mode of transportation and getting things shipped across the country. Uh, transportation via water was the most cost-effective means of moving heavy products such as coal and iron. Consequently, canals were widened uh, and deepened to accommodate large vessels, and the Mississippi River will become a huge economic um, waterway for the um, goods that are produced out west. And you have Robert Fulton, you can see there, uh, I can't really show you those videos, but uh, Robert Fulton was the first inventor of the steamship. So now it makes it easier to go up you know, the Mississippi River. You have a steamship which can push you up instead of having to rely on wind or paddling or what have you. Now you have engine power that can move up against currents so you can use rivers more effectively. Um, roads improved immensely during this time period, better accommodating travels for stagecoaches. Road surfaces were widened and uh, covered with crushed rock. You know, uh, many of you may have like a gravel driveway just like that. Um, and this was ideal for traffic. You can handle a lot more people using it versus just a regular dirt road, which can become muddy, sometimes it becomes impassable. But if you build a good road with drainage on both sides and gravel, you can have a lot of traffic and that road's not going to deteriorate as quickly. Uh, you can see here the construction of the roads. I'll let you guys go back and look at that if you're interested. Um, the federal government recognized and subsidized the need for massive railroad expansion, especially westward. So the first place that will be connected is places like Missouri and then on across the um, the Mississippi River into the Great Plains. Go over that pretty quick. Steam power, again, is what is being used to power all of these trains and all of these uh, boats. Pretty much using coal, burning coal to heat up water that creates pressure, which you can use to turn a piston. Therefore, you have power, which can get you where you need to go. Skip over here. Um, so I'm going to stop it right here and I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap part one up so, and then I'll start here with part two.